You good to go? Go, excellent. So that's a word I love to hear, go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you with us uh, back again here in the audience. And to everyone joining us online, good to have you as well. We are good to go, right? We're live. Are we live online? Yes. Excellent. Brilliant. Uh, yes, warm welcome as we uh, join us in this discussion on hydrogen as we consider its potential as a fuel of the future. Hydrogen, of course, being heralded as the climate-friendly alternative to fossil fuels. It's cheap. It's clean burning. It's able to power engines, produce electricity, and provide heat. And proponents say it will aid our transition to a net zero world. To clarify, hydrogen is already being used in industries uh, to a certain st extent, but most of it right now is produced from coal and gas. And the goal is to produce it at scale using clean electricity to reduce emissions. But scaling up production of so-called green hydrogen using renewables like wind and solar has a number of inherent challenges. And these include creating harmonized standards for safety, for interoperability across borders, and sustainability throughout the whole hydrogen value chain. And of course, developing economies are going to need specific support in order to participate in and benefit from clean hydrogen projects. So over the next hour, with the help of our fabulous panel, we're going to be examining hydrogen's potential and limitations and look at how we can turn the technology into a trade that tackles the climate crisis. Just a reminder that translation is available in several languages via the Interprefy app, uh, and that is both here through the QR code that's dotted around everywhere and the uh, online streaming platform. Uh, let me introduce our speakers. So here with me in the studio, I have Bob Kreiner, who is the co-founder and CEO of Stralis Aircraft in Brisbane, and Juan Pablo Davila, Industrial Development Officer at Unido in Mexico. That's the uh, UN's uh, Industrial Development Organization. And joining us virtually, we have Daria Nachevnik, Director of the Hydrogen Council in Belgium. Hello, Daria. And Phil O'Neill, Energy Transition Partner of Advision in Australia. A warm welcome to uh, all of my speakers. And uh, we will, of course, be taking questions from the audience. If you're joining us online, put those questions into the Q&A box uh, and they'll come through to us. And I should also mention that our scriber, Rachel, is hard at work behind the scenes. Uh, you will see her work pop up from time to time on the screen behind us as she makes a, a crafts an image out of the conversation that we're having here today. So let's dive in. And Bob, I, I really want to start with you because I'm, I'm really interested to hear about what Stralis Aircraft uh, is up to. It's part of the Hydrogen Flight Alliance, and this is aimed at, net, uh, at zero emissions commercial flights. And you're hoping that your first hydrogen flight hydrogen powered flight is going to take off from Brisbane Airport in 2026? Is That's that right. right. That's the plan. That is amazing. Now, talk us through the challenges of that, because I, I guess that uh, one of the difficulties is making green hydrogen both ready, readily available, but also affordable. Yeah, just so <clears throat> maybe just a little bit of background real quick about what we do at Stralis. So we make emission free aircraft that are powered by green hydrogen. So the only emission is water vapor. Um, yeah, so we're based here in Brisbane, and we've recently launched this Hydrogen Flight Alliance, which is really to address a key question. So we're working on developing the aircraft, but a lot of people ask us, where are we going to get cheap green hydrogen at airports everywhere? And we were, you know, clearly we realized early on we can't do that alone. That requires industry collaboration and bringing in key experts in different domains. So the Hydrogen Flight Alliance has airports, airlines, us making the aircraft, and also green hydrogen logistics providers. Um, to, to make green hydrogen um, affordable, so some of the key cost drivers that go into that, obviously the renewable energy that's used to create it, and there's a lot of work being done in that area to drive the cost of renewables down. Um, it's directly linked to where you make that energy and the amount of storage available, but there's sort of significant progress being made in that avenue. Um, another key piece of what we do with aircraft is we need liquid hydrogen on board. So liquid hydrogen um, allows us to fly farther and carry more passengers a useful distance. Um, but not all industries are using liquid, and that also comes Does with it? Liquid cost. sounds a little bit 
dangerous? <laughs> I mean, it's cold. <laughs> um, it, it does. It has unique aspects. So there are you can store hydrogen as a high pressurized gas, which comes with its own safety risks involved. For example, if the tank fails, you have an explosion. Um, liquid hydrogen is cold, and there are different elements. So it's a vacuum sealed tank. But we believe um, using a lot of learnings from, for example. For example, NASA, they've been using liquid hydrogen for, for decades now, so we're trying to leverage learnings there, and we think liquid hydrogen on aircraft can be as safe, if not safer, than current fuels that are used. So the vision is a future where uh, aviation is hydrogen fueled. We'll all be getting on planes which are powered by powered by hydrogen? We actually think it's, it's, it's dual. We think that there's sustainable aviation fuel, which we see um, fitting the near term, so you can drop that into aircraft today, and that will serve near term and also long distance travel, but we think hydrogen electric is perfect for decarbonizing flights up to 3,000 kilometers and reducing the cost of operating those aircraft. Uh, and just a little um, final question for you. Uh, I mean, it's clear that lots of countries, including Australia, are now investing in green hydrogen technology. But is it really important to make sure that everyone's talking the same language, everyone's in, this, in alignment, that stakeholders are using the same benchmarks and targets so that all the different sectors can operate seamlessly? Absolutely. I think that that is really essential. Um, one of the things we're realizing is the, the amount of hydrogen that we need to power our aircraft, <coughs> the scale is not really where it needs to be. So we really need not only our industry, but all industries to be marching in lockstep and working in unison to really move the global green hydrogen industry forward. Um, and I think that's where organizations such as ISO and other standards bodies, um, safety standards that, that kind of capture lessons learned in one part of the world, standardize it, and then other people around the world can use that to move as quickly and, and kind of keep up with the pack. So. Bob, thank you. Daria, let me bring you in here, um, because uh, as we've heard from Bob, the potential for hydrogen is immense, isn't it? Where does it stand globally right now? First of all, thank you so much for having me today. And I would like to say that uh, it's wonderful to see this flagship ISO conference feature a dedicated panel session of hydro on hydrogen. This is, of course, extremely timely. And ISO will play a critical role in facilitating the development of a global hydrogen economy. And of course, we're going to talk about it in a moment. Um, indeed, uh, as you know, hydrogen is a critical vector for decarbonization globally. We have heard about the aviation sector. And of course, there are multiple other end uses for which hydrogen can provide deep decarbonization opportunities and helping us abate some 80 gigaton of CO2 by mid-century. Now, um, Today, globally, we have a pipeline of a mature, <clears throat> mature project proposals um, at about over a thousand projects globally across the value chain. And there is an opportunity to unlock some 350 billion in investment in clean hydrogen across the, that value chain. Now, out of total announcements, about 10% have reached the final investment decision. And we have seen a number of challenges that projects are facing today. Those include um, offtake risks, uh, some of the delays in permitting process, processes, but also in critically um, lack of harmonized standards uh, for hydrogen and derivatives. And um, um, of course, we're going to talk about uh, that a little bit later on. Um, but I would want to highlight that actually, if we take a step back and reflect on where we stand now, taking a historical perspective on hydrogen, um, we are actually, we have made a huge step forward. So we moved from 20 billion in final investment decisions in 2022 to 30 billion in FID projects internationally as of January, 2023. Now it took, it used to take the industry 10 years to get to a single billion. And now we have jumped from 20 to 30 billion in one year. So relative to the history of hydrogen, actually the deliberate number is still enormous. And we see um, quite substantial progress with deployment across the value chain. We have some 8.8 .8 gigawatt in installed electrolysis manufacturing capacity um, as of January 2023. So that's 150% year on year on year growth. 12 gigawatts of installed fuel cell manufacturing capacity. That's 10% increase year on year. We have 80,000 cars on the road today, fuel cell electric vehicles. That's 30% year in year increase. And 130 vehicle models being launched by OEMs, which is a 
percent year on year increase. These are just some examples that demonstrate that um, that the pace and the scale of progress with deployment has been substantial. And while we are facing some challenges, some of which we are going to discuss later today, um, the deployment has certainly been growing steadily. Yeah, it's interesting because hydrogen has been touted as a, a fuel of the future um, a, a while ago, but now it seems as though the momentum and the investments are, are really gathering pace. Uh, I know you're involved in, in developing standards around the use of hydrogen. Uh, how do you think inter international standards can help enhance and, and support that hydrogen trade? Indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the development of common global standards and um, the role of ISO standards in hydrogen is and will be critical going forward. Of course, we know that in ISO there is a dedicated committee, ISO TC 197, hydrogen technologies that leads standardization in the field of systems and devices for production, storage and transport and, and use of hydrogen. Um, and as one of the examples, of course, TC 197 subcommittee one, hydrogen at scale and horizontal energy systems has been focusing on the development of a methodology for greenhouse gas emissions assessment of different hydrogen production conditioning and transportation pathways. Um, I think that that is a great example of the role of ISO in enabling transparency on the carbon footprint of hydrogen across geographies, um, also facilitating the development of consumer trust, uh, facilitating the um, development of confidence among the investors into hydrogen as a new asset class. And we know that, again, ISO standards are already used widely in legislative frameworks that underpin the deployment of hydrogen, um, in particular, for example, the EU taxonomy for sustainable finance that refers to ISO standards. But the development, I think that this example of ISO developing a, a global methodology for assessing the greenhouse gas emissions of hydrogen across the value chain, um, well to gates of production, conditioning and transport is absolutely critical. And it will be a key precursor for the development of the global industry and for facilitating global cross-border trade in hydrogen because it allows us effectively to compare apples and apples. You know, countries across geographies are currently introducing their own, um, for example, thresholds for um, qualifying hydrogen at national level as uh, clean, uh, green or sustainable. And these thresholds vary across geographies, across jurisdictions. But let's say if a country A has thresholds of, of two kilos per CO2 um, equivalent per kilo of hydrogen, and let's say country B also has a threshold of two kilos of CO2 equivalent per kilo of hydrogen to qualify hydrogen as clean. If you use different methodologies to calculate those um, those values, the two and two effectively mean different things. So the beauty of the ISO standard and the value of ISO standard is develop, is providing and enabling that transparency um, and allowing us to compare different hydrogen pathways on a level playing field, focusing on uh, the carbon footprint. And of course, going forward, uh, I do believe that there is great potential for expanding the family of uh, ISO hydrogen standards to other sustainability attributes of hydrogen. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Phil, let me bring you in here because um, from an industrial perspective, many industries already use hydrogen, but it's not low carbon hydrogen. So what difficulties do they face when they're transitioning to clean hydrogen? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, I think existing industries uh, have some great advantages. You know, if you've got an existing demand for hydrogen, um, you know, it can drive a low carbon hydrogen development forward and reduce that risk of offtake. Often offtake is the key part that's missing in, in some of these projects, particularly in the Australian region. And um, those operators will already have experience handling hydrogen, which many of the um, companies that are now positioning themselves in the green hydrogen space actually do not. So I think there's a, there's a key advantage there, but there's certainly they'll face challenges for sure. And the most obvious one is establishing the business case um, for low carbon alternatives. Um, adding CCS to existing uh, you know, gas or coal based hydrogen by definition adds cost. So therefore you've got to find someone to pay that extra cost. Um, and hydrogen from renewable energy by electrolysis has yet to cross that um, threshold into, into being cost competitive. 
So most of the projects, or pretty much all the projects, are seeking some kind of government funding to get them to uh, to occur, which um, you know, can be can be a real challenge. And downstream, there's there's also uh, integration issues. Um, so you trying to take a, a variable renewable uh, resource and match that to potentially a downstream process like ammonia that actually prefers to run consistently and not vary during the day and the night and over a week and a month. And, uh, you know, we've got to find cost-effective ways to buffer that energy to make it um, more uh, smooth, but also um, we've got to also look at making those plants more flexible to um, to minimise that, that storage requirement. So it's not clear how far we can push these technologies and, and to create that more flexible system. Um, but it's certainly work that's underway at the moment to address that challenge. Daria was uh, speaking about how standards can help with common terminology and common um, uh, correct measurements um, uh, when it comes to the hydrogen trade. What about how will industries benefit from common standards when it comes to things like uh, like storage or transporting or, or processing hydrogen? Yeah, so we, we've published some work with Princeton University that considers the gap between our decarbonisation ambitions and reality. And uh, we've concluded that standardisation is one of the five shifts required to deliver on the accelerated projects and unprecedented scale that we have to uh, develop in the coming decade. And in the third paper released this year, we focused on the renewable hydrogen industry as an example. And we found that uh, the ambition or the objective of the EU to achieve 10 megatons per annum of renewable hydrogen by 2030 will fall short using current methodologies. So for context, we're currently producing less than 20 kilotons per annum of renewable hydrogen in the EU. Um, so that ambition is not going to be satisfied by small bespoke projects. So um, we reckon that it could take to do a, to a reasonable size project towards that um, that goal, of which you're probably going to need 25 of them, you'll need to do three gigawatt projects as a minimum. And so we think that by taking a different approach, a standardised approach, that that could be accelerated by more than 30% while maintaining the capital discipline of the gated process of, of getting through those projects. So internationally being able to standardize not just um, the designs but also the equipment will enable uh, the rollout of uh, projects across the globe so many of the developers of hydrogen projects globally are looking to do multiple projects in different jurisdictions and you know it's it'll be great if you could have a hundred percent standard electrolyzer and balance of plant module and you could send that to uh, australia chile namibia oman and not have to worry about complying with local standards because everything just uh, is just fits and uh, for our part we are committed to leading a group on um, standardization and EU on uh, renewable hydrogen which aims to accelerate and move towards a uh, standard approach to hydrogen production assets and to help accelerate those projects and um, while massively increasing the scale to get to that three gigawatt uh, level so we think that's an exciting initiative and we hope it will unlock value for the industry and get us closer to the ambitions that have been set. Bill, thank you. Um, Juan Pablo, let's talk about developing countries because um, they face particular barriers in taking part in the hydrogen market. I mean, there's lack of resources, lack of equipment, infrastructure. I mean, talk us through the, the, the main problems. Thank you. Yes, I think uh, uh, you have seen by the other presenters the different challenges that are now on developed economies which are the more advanced to develop their hydrogen ecosystem and a hydrogen value chain. And indeed, when it comes to a developing country, you can think of these same challenges, but into an exponential manner. And in, in addition, all the areas of opportunity that developing countries have. For example, uh, the regulation that may not be there for ensuring that investments can operate, whether it's hydrogen or whether it's any other investment, many developing countries do not have the regulations that can secure investments. Um, the technology factor, uh, technologies come from developed countries. It, it has to be a technology transfer from one point to another. This involves as well skills to operate the technology, skills to maintain the technology. Um, 
skills to have in place that support industry that will give uh, uh, the hydrogen value chain the support that is needed and that can hydrogen can be produced from renewable to to from electrons to molecules the basic of green hydrogen is renewable renewables some countries do not have the capacity to have this spare capacity of renewables it needs to build again again renewable capacity um, I think those are the, some of the key elements. Daria was mentioning the off-taking. It's also very important that developing countries have a clear target where the hydrogen or where the different products made by hydrogen, because we were talking about hydrogen, but we also should be talking about those products can be decarbonized or green products that will benefit from the use of green hydrogen, like ammonia, like steel, like cement. Um, just to mention some of the, the key areas of developing countries, at UNIDO, we have been working with developing countries in many other sectors, and it is very important to also build awareness on the governments on what are the implications of a new technology, of a new value chain in terms of, as I mentioned, the technology, the policies that are required, the regulations that are required, the skills that need to be in anticipation of this MOUs and these projects to be in place. UNIDO is, is very involved in this, isn't it? Uh, and, and it's helping developing countries. Uh, I think you've got the global program, which is uh, helping them to try and make the transition. Yes, indeed, UNIDO, uh, we have a global program for hydrogen in industry, where we support developing countries in their efforts to ramp up uh, hydrogen. Um, within this program, we have five key areas of intervention. And I think you will, you will see that it relates to the different challenges that we have been mentioning. On the policy support, what are the policies that are required at each step of the value chain, upstream, transportation, storage, and uh, downstream? How can developing countries uh, incentivize the demand? Um, another area is the um, innovation that developing countries would also look into not just being the receptions of the technology, but they also have plans in order to be uh, aware and, and, and eventually contribute to the development of new technologies for the value chain. Another area that we have in the uh, program is skills development. Skills development, Europe recently, I mean, there, there is a study that Europe at the European level uh, identify what are the skills that will be required on the green hydrogen economy. And they come up with some skills that uh, are in stress, will be in stress. I mean, we can talk about uh, electrical engineers, of course, electrochemical engineers. And one skill that is also identified as being under stress, that will be under stress, is certification of uh, uh, hydrogen. So the skills development is very important. It's one of the pillars of our program. Um, financing and investment, it's another pillar where we need to make sure that the investments will land in a safe place. Uh, also considering the social impact and the environmental impact of the investments. Uh, and then we partner with different banks, development banks, so this investment can be a, a, a reality. So these are five, five areas that we will look into that. There's one missing area standards. We also look at standards and you can see within these areas they all relate and they all are in need of standards. You need standards for policy instruments, you need standards for innovation, you need standards for skills. What are the standards to certify an auditor, to certify a, uh, a verifier, an inspector of a facility? Um, so this is standards is, is also one of the key pillars that interacts with all of the other technical pillars that we see that are very important to streamline the ramp up of hydrogen. Yeah, and that's going to enable these countries to come into line with uh, the, the, the hydrogen trade ac across the board, across borders. Um, thank you very much indeed. Now, we do have a couple of questions from stakeholders about the hydrogen trade and technology, and they're going to put these questions uh, to the panelists. So our first question is coming to us from 
Brazil. Uh, this is Gabriel Lassery, Executive Superintendent of the Brazilian Hydrogen Association. So I think we can have Gabriel online now. And uh, if you're there, Gabriel, please, uh, Gabriel, please ask your question to our panelists. Hello, uh, thank you very much. Good, good morning, good afternoon, good night to everyone. Congratulations to all panelists. I do see some familiar faces and I'm very happy with the outcome of the session and also to be here. So uh, my question goes to all the panelists. I think each one will have an interesting take in this matter. And just to give a brief background on my question. Well, uh, right now Brazil is going through a very key moment regarding regulations and signaling incentives for uh, projects on hydrogen and hydrogen derivatives. We just had the updated national hydrogen strategy coming out of public consultation in Brazil, being so diverse in natural resources, plus having one of the cleanest energy mixes in the world. One aspect that is being taken into account is to not create a pre-selection of technologies for the hydrogen value chain. So uh, my question is, how do you see the importance of a global unified framework and pu of public regulations to foster the reduction of greenhouse gases in the hydrogen value chain but at the same time help push the opening of new emerging markets and also how they expect different technologies for hydrogen production to coexist in the near future. Thank you. Gabriel, thank you very much indeed. Um, I, I think this, uh, I'm gonna direct this question towards either Daria or Phil. This is a question about work around unified frameworks uh, regarding CO2 emissions and how different technologies can operate together. Um, Daria or, or Phil, uh, does, does one of you, um, any takers for this question? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about uh, technologies. I think um, that's, that's another one of the, uh, the five um, key shifts that we identified is that um, whatever we're working on today, new technologies will come along that will uh, help us achieve our ambitions uh, in, a, in a more efficient and more cost-effective way. So we have to make sure that all options remain on the table. So when we're talking about standardization, we still need to clear a space in that standardization for change in the future so that we don't get locked into to one particular way of doing it. And I guess the classic case in, in renewable hydrogen is, is electrolysis. At the moment, we're looking at um, most of the plants being designed with low temperature electrolysis uh, systems. Uh, you know, and that over the coming decade, it could come to pass that certain um, configurations with high temperature electrolysis, uh, solid oxide electrolysis cells could um, become a very viable alternative. So we have to make sure we're open to that. We don't get locked into um, to a certain pathway. Phil, thank you. Dario, do you want to add anything about the uh, activity on, on certification or public regulations uh, through a unified uh, framework? Uh, you, you mentioned comparing apples to apples, which is uh, exactly the, the phrase that Gabriel Absolutely. used. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the beauty of the ISO methodology and greenhouse gas emissions assessment of hydrogen pathways is that it's technology inclusive. It doesn't pick winners. It provides transparency and it effectively allows the least carbon intensive solution to shine. And I think that that's absolutely key because what we see globally is that there will be, and there are already differences in terms of national policy choices around different um, hydrogen production or again transportation pathways that may be favored in one jurisdiction and uh, over another. But having said that, I think that um, while we, and of course, different countries pursue different um, and, and support different hydrogen pathways based on their local natural resource endowments, technology endowments. So these national circumstances, they very much condition the policy choices. So inherently, these choices are different and they will be different. But providing transparency, credibility and trustworthiness at the global level is really something that the ISO standards can help us with. And in that sense, it's equally important for developing, so emerging markets in developing countries and for developed economies. Um, and we are delighted to be cooperating with unique Apologies for the, the slight patchiness of the, uh, the, uh, the connection there, um, but we got the gist of that. Daryl, um, thank, thank you. We are losing uh, these power. 
let's leave it there. Um, Gabriel, thank you very much indeed for your uh, question. We uh, appreciate that. Um, we have another question, this time from Germany, from Anne-Catherine Lippener, Associate Program Officer at the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. And this question is specifically for you, Juan Pablo. Um, Anne-Catherine, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, good morning from Germany, and um, I would like to dig a little bit into the difficulties, uh, Juan Pablo, that you have mentioned that developing countries encounter when they are trying to establish green hydrogen infrastructure. And we at ARENA, we also look into the policy side and target side. And what we have observed lately is uh, that we have many countries, um, also developing countries, that emphasize they would like to export hydrogen most of the time also rather than using it locally first. Um, and we only have a few markets, a few uh, regions and countries like uh, Europe or East Asia, specifically South Korea and Japan, that plan to become major import markets for green hydrogen. And what we see is in the mid and long term, this could result in a competition among green hydrogen suppliers. Uh, and also be a risk uh, for producer countries and uh, not to find enough off takers for the hydrogen exports. How can we or how can you address long term risks like that and enable countries to establish mutual beneficial partnerships? And how should we address that not all countries will be major hydrogen exporters, but just a few of them? And how can we support like also the domestic use of green hydrogen for those applications that create most value in hard to abate sectors? Okay, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you for your question. So there's a couple of issues there, Juan Pablo. Um, I'll try and sum up. Um, so uh, increasing the use, uh, the domestic use of hydrogen, um, particularly in hard to abate sectors, but also um, balancing the import and export markets so that perhaps countries can create mutually beneficial partnerships so that everyone can benefit from hydrogen? How would you answer that? I think that's a, that's a very good question, uh, especially with the hype that is, uh, we can call it a hype of hydrogen uh, and the different opportunities that developed countries have shown that in the future they will be requiring high quantities of hydrogen. Uh, for developing countries, we see, yes, exports is one benefit, economic, socially, and environmental, but also will they will need to start looking and start now looking at what are the benefits for the local industry. If we're talking about exporting hydrogen, can we look about adding value to those exports? Meaning not necessarily exporting the hydrogen or ammonia, but adding value, green, green products where hydrogen can make a contribution. It is also known that in Europe, for example, the CBAM will come soon. And this is the content of uh, uh, emissions within different products. And this will be eventually a problem for developing countries. So this will need to be prepared not to think only about exports of hydrogen, but exports of green goods. In addition to exploiting the use of hydrogen in their uh, for their own benefits. Uh, of course, there's a need for investments, but there are some low-hanging fruits that developing countries can start thinking of. Uh, one is to replace the gray hydrogen with green hydrogen on ammonia production. Another is the applications in different mobility uh, uh, modes. Uh, so just, just that, uh, but is it really close to our mandate to ensure that developing countries will have benefiting of the green hydrogen economy and not only looking to export. Thank you. Thank you, Anne Catherine, for your question. Um, Bob, can I ask you, um, we're talking a lot about um, sort of expanding the hydrogen trade. Um, do you think governments and policymakers should be looking at this and offering incentives to bring yeah. it along to the track? Yeah, we do. So <clears throat> it's quite interesting. So we're a startup and we're venture capital backed. So I've been out raising money over the last sort of six to nine months. Um, and I think, you know, there's the economic climate that we live in today, which is sort of challenging in and of itself. But I think there's there's a lot of concern from investors. There's a lot of money to be invested into this green hydrogen industry, but there's sort of hesitation. They aren't sure where in the world to invest that money. Um, <clears throat> us being down here in Australia, I would see us as like a pretty advanced country in terms of hydrogen. We have a hydrogen strategy. We're an advanced economy. 
Um, but for example, when I go out to try and find liquid hydrogen to put in our aircraft, we I can't find it in Australia. No one makes it at wow. the moment. So, so there's like these views that some countries are, are, are more advanced, um, and I don't think we're really there yet. And I think that um, policy and funding will really accelerate that. So ag again, if there's a sense of um, yeah, security or, or safety that this industry has a clear roadmap going forward and that governments are backing it and supporting it, they will pour additional private capital in that I think will help, yeah, accelerate and advance. It's what interesting. What one thing Juan Pablo said was that um, he works a lot with governments uh, trying to tell them about the importance of, of the hydrogen trade, of, of mm -hmm. green hydrogen and yeah. what it will mean. Do you think uh, um, there still needs to be that kind of persuasion? Surely everyone now is on board with a net zero future and, and we know what the potential of hydrogen is. So shouldn't we all be on board for the ride? Jumping on board. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely on there. You know, we've, we've leaned into it and um, hung our hat on it. I think one of the concerns people raise is, is green hydrogen, uh, w what is it a solution for? For example, does it make sense for cars? I think it's been pretty clear that battery electric cars seem to be the, the clear leader versus hydrogen powered cars. So I think the real question out there is, um, yes, governments can go and say, let's do this, this particular industry should go green hydrogen, but I think it's more like on an economic side, investors and, and everyone should be looking at, is this the right technology for this particular industry? So aviation, which I'm really close to, it makes perfect sense, it's a lightweight fuel, but I think there are other areas where, um, yeah, it's a little bit unclear. So I think just having hard policy that says this must be done. Mm -hmm. um, there's an example, we've produced liquid hydrogen in Australia a couple of years ago and exported it to Asia. And I think that that was an exercise to prove technical feasibility, but there's a lot of discussion and debate around, does that make sense? Is that a is that a smart thing to do to make green hydrogen in Australia, liquefy it and ship it to other countries around the world? Um, so I think we really need to let the technology and the, the techno-economic analysis show us the way instead of just hard policy that says that's the way we should go. But Excellent. Guys, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to uh, take some questions from the floor. Um, I'd like to start with a couple of questions that um, have come in online. And there's a couple of questions about cost, uh, which is interesting. Um, so a couple of questions are asking, is green hydrogen production feasible in developing countries in terms of cost? Um, and how does hydrogen compare to other fuels as a return on investment? Don't you lose a lot of electricity by the time you've processed and transported it? Um, Phil, I don't know if that, I, kn I, I know you were talking a little bit about um, cost earlier, but uh, it, as a return on investment, uh, is, is it, a, is it a, a good fuel to use? I, I think it comes down to exactly what uh, Bob just said, that um, you've got to pick the right place to use hydrogen. Um, it can do a lot of things, but the question is, there's a lot of things you have to question whether it should be doing those in the in the short, medium, and even long term. And um, you know, there are some applications like potentially uh, heavy mobility, so large locomotives and potentially long haul trucks, mining trucks type thing, where if you can get uh, lowest low enough cost renewable energy, low enough cost conversion, and high efficiencies and low maintenance costs that you can actually envisage a um, uh, actually being more cost effective than than diesel fuel. Um, but that that's a bit in the future, and there's a, there's a few things that have to happen. But it does does hold some promise. Other areas uh, may be just difficult for hydrogen, but I, so I think focusing on those ones where it looks. Uh, Interesting, based on the techno-economics, but also those hard-to-abate sectors. So we've talked about um, steel, uh, potentially cement. Uh, you know, if you're going to decarbonise those, how are you going to do it without hydrogen? It's actually a really tough question. Uh, and uh, another question that's come on and uh, come to us from online audience, and this has been repeated several times. So it's obviously uh, a question that a lot of people are, are worried about. Hydrogen is a very combustible gas. How do we ensure it's uh, safely used as a fuel? What Another question, what, what progress has been made in standardizing it to help uh, in transportation and in trade? Another question, uh, highly flammable. How do we ensure the safe use of hydrogen? Um, who, who wants to talk about that? Because that that would actually come under standards, and th there there will be a uh, you know a way of transporting. Um, it, it's something that the ISO and IEC I think are, are looking at. Daria, is this is this in your remit uh, the the safe transportation of of uh, hydrogen? 
I think that we are building, the good news is that we are building on a robust body of safety standards, a variety of which have already been and are developed by um, uh, standard development organizations, in particular ISO. Um, I think that while there is a lot of interest in hydrogen and has been growing in the past two years, it's important to recognize that this technology effectively um, has been developed and has been uh, uh, taken up already in the 80s. Um, and of course, <clears throat> Bob may remember the development of hydrogen um, um, actually I know, I know uh, back then. And that was <laughs> uh, including in... in <laughs> yeah, you, you, you'll be, you'll be, of course, um, uh, you better, you're a better place to elaborate on that. But what I want to say is, is that while public interest in hydrogen has been relatively fresh, the industry has a really long history of um, in the development of um, relevant technologies and the supporting safety standards as well as the, the supporting technical standards. So I think that we again we are building on a robust body of, of safety standards. The the key priority right now is to make sure that these standards are fit for scaling up mm. because the scale up challenge means that we need to ensure that the standards are fit for purpose and some of them may need to be elaborated further expanded uh, and this is something that again the relevant committees within the iso are, are working on as we speak so the good news is the work is also underway um, and um, I have um, full confidence that we're going to ensure that those safety standards are fit for purpose. Thank you. Do you want to add to that? Uh, uh, Bob? Um, yeah, I think it's so aviation is an, an intrinsically safe industry. We do a lot of testing. We need to, you know, we're highly regulated. Um, <clears throat> so I think the way we look at this is really one, let's, let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, like it's been said, hydrogen has been used in different industries for a long time. So let's start by looking at that. And, you know, there are, um, it hasn't been used at scale, but there are people around there out in the world that, that know how to work with it safely. Um, and I think and the, the other thing, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about it. There'll be uh, plenty of opportunity. Juan Pablo. Yes, I, I think um, c uh, building on that idea that uh, hydrogen has been here for many years already, um, uh, I used to say it's not rocket science, but it, it is. It was rocket science. And a rocket science. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think uh, there is a need for standards, uh, building awareness in those countries that do not have yet the knowledge on how to deal, to transport, to to produce hydrogen. Uh, the safety standards are are there, uh, but the capacity in developing countries may not be there yet. And this is very important for developing countries, not only to have the standards, the international standards that are being developed, are being discussed, to adopt them in their national, whether it's regulations or voluntary standards. And thirdly, and very important, that they have the capacity to assess, the conformity assessment required to assess against those standards. Uh, that they have the instruments, what is related to safety, to leakages, uh, even going further to have the personal uh, train for first responders in case of accident with hydrogen or leakages with hydrogen. I mean, this is, this is a thing that it might be uh, uh, common for some developed countries, but in some developing countries, there's no other basic knowledge on these type of uh, issues. Thank you. Let's take a question from the floor. Um, if you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. A microphone will find its way to you. And if you could just stand up and um, say your your name and where you're uh, where you're speaking from. Uh, ah, over here in the corner. Thank you. Microphone is on its way to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dale Mohammed from GSO. Uh, just uh, uh, the hydrogen. Uh, bomb, that's a one thing, and then we've got the challenges, the space shuttle Challenger, which has exploded and, and made that disaster from NASA, it was uh, like late 80s, and it was because of that uh, liquid hydrogen leak. How does this intersect with that? Just to know. Thank you. So this is another safety question, okay? Yeah, I mean, <coughs> this is a question that we get asked quite a lot, fantastic question. Well aware of that. I think, again, this these 
um, these accidents happened, tragic loss of life. I, th I think the way we look at that, so spacecraft and, and the issues that they have around refueling those aircraft um, through their sort of the, the technical details of those interfaces are quite different. <coughs> so there's like a quick release when you launch a rocket. And so the, the technology used for those attachments is quite different to what we use today. So for example, there are hydrogen powered cars that you, that the, the you know, general public can go and refill at a refueling station um, and that refueling is as safe as if you charge an electric car or if you refuel your petrol car so i think um, there were a lot of lessons learned from those accidents in the past but i think the the use case that we're looking at for commercial aircraft are quite different to those rockets and and the interfaces that they're using and i think it's it's been proven that um, hydrogen vehicles can be refueled safely even by unskilled people. Um, and, and again, that's around the, the design of those refueling units. You know, they, they connect in, there's safety interlocks that check, and if there's anything that's not um, okay or that the system, if it can't detect that, it won't allow the hydrogen valves to, to open, so. You see, I, I would choose to believe that an industry wouldn't allow um, hydrogen fuel for aviation to go forward unless it was safe. But I do understand that a lot of people are a little bit nervous about getting on a commercial flight that is powered by hydrogen. Who would be nervous about getting on a plane powered by hydrogen? Yeah, a few, a few hands. I feel like they're being shy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can be honest. So as far as the first commercial flight in 2026 I is concerned, who's going to be on that flight? Um, if anyone wants to get a ticket, I can <laughs> connect you with Sky Skytrans. <laughs> Thank you. I love the optimism. I, I mean, just it's a really... I think you'll find the moderator gets first dibs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you a special mate's rate, yeah. No, I think th this really is... Um, before you set foot on this aircraft, it will be certified. And in order for us to get a type certificate for our airplane, we have to go through rigorous testing and we have to meet or exceed the current safe level of safety that you come to expect from conventional aircraft that you've flown on for a long time. I think that's one of the beauties of aerospace is that in order for us as a company to be able to sell our airplanes to airlines and for you, the paying public, to get on them, um, you, you will know that, that we've been through this rigorous, and, and there's really no question that the level of safety in aviation has increased dramatically over the last 10, 20, 30 years. We design our systems with safety first and foremost. Um, we derive the requirements around that. And then we execute a rigorous test program first on the ground. So we're doing a bunch of testing at our facility at Brisbane Airport right now. So we, we have powertrains running. And by the time that aircraft gets certified, it would have run for thousands of hours without any, any failures. So um, yeah, rest assured, it is challenging. We take safety seriously, mm -hmm. but there, there are um, checks and balances in place that, that protect yeah, the, the public from anything bad happening. I, ho I hope that's provided some reassurance. <laughs> uh, how about another question from the floor? Um, Ge uh, gentlemen, um, third seat from the end there. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, bit if you can uh, stand up, sir, so we can just sorry, put the camera on. Sorry, Thank you Australia. Uh, can you tell me how you <coughs> control the generation of nitrogen dioxide and uh, hence world smog by hydrogen combustion with air? Is that directed to Is us? that to anyone in particular? To, well, anyone involved um, with hydrogen may combustion. Maybe is okay. this so, ni so nitrogen dioxide production. Um, maybe one of our, um, uh, maybe Phil, is this a, a, a transition question? Uh, yeah, I, th I think it is. And I know the, um, there are certainly applications looking at combusting hydrogen, in, including in turbines for power generation and possibly aircraft. Um, the, I think the short story is that more NOx uh, can be produced because of the um, the temperature of the of the combustion, but uh, that that can be post treated just like today. NOx is post treated on Euro six diesel engines and and power stations, and I think every country except Australia um, have to have uh, NOx controls on the on the back end. So um, not not a new problem, but perhaps another layer of um, treatment required to treat it in the future. Um, Maybe just to, just yeah, to jump in, sorry, please. just real quick, concise answer. <clears throat> so just to be clear, our aircraft are hydrogen electric powered. So we have an electric motor that receives power from a fuel cell, and that fuel cell takes in hydrogen from a storage tank and oxygen. So there's no actual combustion on our particular aircraft. Rolls-Royce, for example, is looking at combusting hydrogen. We've chosen the uh, hydrogen electric route, one, because it, it is, you know, 
pure, clean, you, the only byproduct is water. Um, but the other advantage is when you go electric, you get dramatically reduced maintenance costs as opposed to burning fuel at high temperatures in a, in a turbine. So yeah, there's, there's a win-win there. You get no emissions and you get a cheaper aircraft to operate. So, but great question. Yeah. Thank you, thank you for clarifying. Another question from the floor. Um, gentleman in the center here in the blue shirt, he's got his hand up. If you pass them, I was going to say, if you pass the mic along the line, but you've done it. Well done. Thank you. Good afternoon. I've been uh, anxiously awaiting this uh, part of the sessions. And uh, my question is, has there been any storage? I know you're in aircraft and you're for light, but the old hydride storage, <coughs> is anybody working on the, the safe hydride storage for mobile equipment on the ground? Hydride storage, it's very heavy, but it's very safe. Has anybody been working to develop that? That's an older technology that was developed ooh, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, hydrate storage. Yes, you take, you take a, like a, a metal titanium storage. iron and you put hydrogen into it. It uh, basically oh. stores the hydrogen. You can use it. You can put incinerator bullets through it and they, it will not burn because it's exothermic or endothermic. It absorbs energy when you go to take the hydrogen off of it and when you put the hydrogen back in it, you have to, it reverses the process. Well, and like kind of like well, like I, I will bow to the greater knowledge of Bob here. <laughs> well, I feel like I, I don't <laughs> want to hog up. Again, <laughs> I love all these questions. It's fantastic. Sorry, panelists. I'm not, <laughs> not trying to. Um, yeah, so we definitely have looked into those. And I think one of the key metrics that we look at for our storage tanks is what we call gravimetric index. And that's basically the ratio of fuel in the tank divided by the weight of the full tank, essentially. So we're trying to get high gravimetric index, which means you're carrying more fuel in a lightweight tank. Um, yeah, those, those metal hydrides, unfortunately, they are heavy, and so for the aircraft application, we've chosen to go the vacuum-sealed liquid hydrogen tanks, which we think gets us GIs in the 30% mark, moving up to 50%, 60% in the future, hopefully. Um, but it's a really good point on ground storage. We haven't actually looked into that, so I mean, we are looking at li liquid-to-liquid refueling on the ground, which allows it to happen quite quickly. Um, so there could be some issues around if you stored it in, a, in, in that sort of solid-state storage to get it into liquid and then put it onto the plane, there'd be complexities. But um, yeah, we've looked at it. Unfortunately, it didn't pass the test for getting onto the aircraft. But um, I know that there's a bunch of work happening in that space. And yeah, you never know, right? Things could, breakthroughs can come. So we should continue to push all avenues, I think. It's def definitely being developed for stationary storage at the moment and like a battery type situation. Thank you. Um, Gentleman at the back there with his hand up. If you stand up, thank you very much. Microphone's coming to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name's Chris Wood and I'm from around here, Brisbane. Um, I have a question which I, I guess is again principally for Bob. Um, <laughs> if hydrogen's a lightweight fuel, uh, why the limitation on range of aircraft? Yeah, it's a, a, a great question. We've run the numbers um, time and time again. Um, so essentially, it, it's quite complicated, but to, to give a concise answer, it's so hydrogen, it per, so energy per unit weight, it's three times lighter than jet fuel, but volume, it takes up more space. So really, we're, we're not running into so much of a weight limit as a volume constraint. Um, and the, the other key thing is, so there's the, the hydrogen fuel itself. Fuel cells n have a long way to go. So if you take low temperature PEM fuel cells that are in cars at, and trucks at the moment, and you try to put those into airplanes, um, whilst the fuel is lightweight, the powertrain ends up being quite heavy and, and starts eating into your payload. So we, we need, so we're, for example, developing a high temperature PEM fuel cell stack that's optimized for an aerospace application, which allows us to bring the weight down. Um, our initial aircraft are looking at flying 800 kilometers. It's a 15-seat airplane, and that's pretty similar to the range that the conventional aircraft can fly and, and how airlines typically fly it. So, um, yeah, th the range limitations come when you try to fly, you know, intercontinental for, from Sydney to London or something like that. We're not there yet. So, principally because you want to be able to put passengers on as well? Yeah, exactly. Payload is everything, right? Our <laughs> airlines won't buy it if we can't put passengers on. 
Thank you. Um, I'll take one last question from uh, online. Um, this is a, a question about standards. Uh, hydrogen related safety is very important, but it, it, it's going to require lots of research work. It might be resource intensive. Uh, how is all this going to be funded? Uh, I don't know if, uh, who would like to uh, answer that. Um, Juan Pablo, what's, what's the situation in, in developing countries in terms of funding research into? Um, yes, I, I think for um, developing countries, there's a need to have the right policies to support the development of research, investment, and uh, just with uh, our partners at IRENA, you need an IRENA developed, are developing, and we will launch it at COP, a toolkit on policy where we uh, highlight or we show what are the potential policies in place that countries can take uh, in, into their countries. Uh, we're looking at policy instruments like the regulations that should be at the upstream, midstream, and downstream, uh, subsidies, also support for research and development that can be a combination between private and public funds to uh, support the development of innovative uh, ideas and products and of course uh, market-based uh, uh, approaches uh, with some caps some uh, uh, areas where you incentivize the use of uh, hydrogen in different areas to tackle specifically this offtake problem that at this point in time it is there. But uh, once the whole industry, the whole ecosystem starts flowing, these incentives may, uh, uh, will may, may, may need to, to disappear or may, may need to be on the lower, lower side. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for your questions. It's, it's clear that um, yes, we're all in agreement that, that hydrogen is a potential fuel of the future, but there's clearly a lot of challenges. I mean, there's a, I think there's a lot of exciting work that's being doing, but a lot of challenges in developing the standards around it. Safety is, is clearly one of the aspects that a, a lot of you are worried about, and the, the cost of, of producing the hydrogen um, in the first place and, and, and the effects on the environment. So um, thank you. I'm going to leave it to our panelists to have a, a, a final word, a final thought that they would um, like to leave you with as we, as we consider the future of green hydrogen. Um, so let's get some, uh, some final um, comments from, uh, from you, Daria. Let's start with you. Thank you. I would just highlight that the role of ISO and ISO standards in the development and facilitating the creation of the hydrogen economy globally will is and will be critical. And uh, I think that it is absolutely important to work on raising awareness about the role of ISO standards in the hydrogen space. Of course, again, the work that, that ISO is carrying out is by nature highly technical, but raising awareness, in particular among decision makers about the value of ISO standards will be key going forward to allow us to create It's such a shame that, that, uh, that you broke up a little bit there uh, at the end, Daria, but I know that uh, ISO is going to launch its first hydrogen uh, standard uh, technical specification to coincide with COP28, isn't it? So um, that, that's good to know. Thank you very much indeed, Daria. Um, Phil, let's, uh, let's bring you up. And what's your final thought that you'd like to leave us with? Uh, there's a couple of very quick ones. I guess the one something resonated with me about um, you know, electrical engineers, we need a lot, lot more of them and we need to make sure that they've got globally relevant skills so they're not just electrical engineer who can operate in australia or in south america or asia they've got to be able to have common standards across so that they can be uh, useful across all those different jurisdictions the other one was just on that last point around safety and research i mean i think the um the crcs in australia so the cooperative research centers have done some great stuff over the last few years and I think the new ones that are being developed will um, will continue that and provide some really great inputs for industry or great cooperative opportunities for industry. Phil, thank you very much indeed. Um, Juan Pablo, what would you like to say? Your final thoughts for the audience? Um, I I would say I come back to the the question a bit on the on the fear of the security and the safety. I think uh, 
the answer is here in this I mean in this public trust the standards because that's what will give the safety on the applications and, and the use of, of hydrogen uh, another uh, idea that I want to, to share is participate especially for developing countries participate in the discussions on these technical groups um, there are uh, more developed countries than developing countries participating we as UNIDO and we have been in partnership with Hydrogen Council with ARENA we don't see much of that participation from developing countries in the discussions uh, so you are the representatives of the national standards body if you have projects that are going in your countries on hydrogen be part of the discussions at international level uh, because sooner more sooner than, than, than later you will be confronted at the national level to make use of those standards to ensure the safety, the sustainability, the environmental. Um, and that's my, my last point is uh, the TC197 plenary and uh, working group of SC will be hosted by UNIDO in Vienna on the third week of November. November. Uh, the, the, 13, the week of the 13th of November. So we expect to see more developing countries participating. Yeah, that's a really important message. Be part of the discussion. And Bob, final word to you. Last and least, I'll, <coughs> I'll be quick, wrap it up. Um, yeah, so I think one thing just to the standards community out there, I think what we see often is there are a number of different standards bodies, IEC, ISO, um, ASTM, SAE, and I, I see, you know, when we're going out to look for standards that we can use to develop, certify, you know, um, train our people, there, there is maybe a lack of cohesion. I'm not sure if that can be solved with people in this room, but I think that one call out would be, yeah, really trying to harmonize that landscape because I think harmonization is really key to the industry moving forward together and not reinventing the wheel in different corners of different standards bodies. And then I think another thing that maybe <coughs> you as an audience can't help with necessarily, but is um, we really, to bridge this gap, today you can buy green hydrogen, you can put it in a vehicle and you can move around. It's not cost effective. In the future, there will be a world where there are hydrogen electric aircraft flying and other, other vehicles using hydrogen that's cheap and available widely. To bridge that gap, I think that needs strong policy backed by funding to really help us drive that down the cost curve. Like what was done, I think solar, you saw it happen over the last 10, 20 years, and it's been really effective. Again, we're not asking for handouts, but I think as an industry, we need strong, yeah, strong leadership in that space to yeah, move us forward and get us over the valley of death. And on the other side, there will be a vibrant green hydrogen community um, that, that I think we'll all be a part of. So, and also come back in 2026 um, and you can get on board our <laughs> aircraft to fly. <laughs> Thanks we'll, very we'll, much. we'll be there, Bob, we'll be there. Um, <laughs> thank part. you very much indeed to all of my speakers. Thank you for your questions. Um, it's been a very busy day, hasn't it, uh, here in Brisbane. I think this is the, the last in-person session here today, though there are a couple of virtual uh, panels that are taking place later tonight that, uh, that you can join. Um, I will see you for tomorrow's panels bright and early, but for the moment, please give a round of applause to all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And a big thank you to the technical team for today's work as well. Um, have a good evening, everyone. Thank you.